cardboard, like this glossy yeah. stuff with colors on it. Don't use it. Yeah. Don't use that. Use the brown, just the, the straight brown stuff. And take the tape off of it. Yeah. <laughs> really? You might want to mention about rat lungworm. Rat lungworm and slugs. Um, mm. I don't want to go into that too much because that's a whole big topic. Um, but. You know, properly washing your food, this website, whole website dedicated to it, um, the public health. Um, so just make sure you're washing your food properly um, to take care of that is, is the main thing. I just want to clarify about the um, beds, about the, um, the carpet mulching. Okay, yeah. and here you say you put the mulch on top, but I thought in there you said you put the cardboard on top. Well, cardboard is a cardboard's a bottom layer. The car, the Unless you're using a lot of really weedy stuff, and then you can use another, uh, you can use a layer of cardboard over okay, that. Okay, so it's basically cardboard. You cut the weeds, you put the cardboard. Yeah. Then you put the weeds on top. No, wait a minute. Anything that goes above the cardboard. Yeah. You want to be weed free. Okay. You don't want it to be regrowing. You don't want it to be full of seeds. Okay, so you put the... What do you... I mean, could you just say again which the layers are? For sheet mulching? Yeah. Okay, so the sheet mulching, we're yeah. putting down some compost, manure, amendments, and then we're putting cardboard over that. Okay. And then we're putting mulch on top of that. What about banana okay. and the paper in there? Sure. Yeah, you can put all different kinds of things in there. I think we got the basics of sheet mulching. I want to move on. Um, so we talked a little bit about how we can plant these beds, different ways to plant those. Okay. Um, there's a list here about um, key quick plants um, and where to plant them. So this has a lot to do with zones again, right? The annuals, the things that need more care closer in things that need less care farther out. Also, I prefer to have lower plants close to the house and then graduating as you go out higher and higher. With the exception of maybe a couple trees strategically placed for morning, afternoon shade. <coughs> okay, so I don't really want to go through all of this. It's all there, pretty clear. Yeah? Where are you getting your seed? Where are you getting your seed? <laughs> Um, there was just a seed exchange at La Kea. Excellent place to get. There's seed exchanges. There, I've, I've seen neighbors. quite a few of them. Neighbors, exactly. People who have been growing stuff. Um, there's people here like Lynn. She's been growing some varieties of plants here for how many years? Well, here. I here, that you kept and replanted the seeds how many years? Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. So these plants have had eight years that she's been saving the seeds from them for them to adapt to this local climate. Um, there's a Inola, I think it's Inaola Seed Company. Um, those are some pretty good ones, um, local stuff. Um, also, um, Echo, there's a link to them in the back as well, um, has some seeds. Things based for the tropics. She has, KL has some good seeds, huh? Um, UH has some locally resistant stuff. Yep. They carry those. Up UH the has some locally Gilo, resistant seeds. Mm -hmm. You well, can even mail order them from them. What about Seed Savers Exchange? Seed yeah, Savers Exchange? Yeah. Um, does Seed Savers Exchange have what? Have a presence, have a presence have here? That, uh, no. There's this potentially a seed co-op starting. That we're just looking at that. Okay, there are at, seed chair stations. There's going to be one. One used to be at the Locobor store, yep. huh. and yeah. now Locobor moved to Hilo, so it'll be there. And then there's oh. one in Habi. So mm -hmm. if people want to start another one here in Pahoa, then talk to me and we can figure out where that okay. would be. She's saying if people are interested in starting a seed chair station here in Pahoa, that she's um, that Lynn is the person to talk to you for that. Um, there was a, a, a seed sharing booth at a Locavore store, which has now moved to Hilo, but those seeds will still be there. 
So Locavore Store in Hilo, they're moving to Bayfront in Hilo. I don't know their exact location, they're just moving. Arthur and Catalina, yes. Yeah. Um, so those are just a few places to source these source seeds for locally grown plants. A lot of the stuff we're talking about, most of the stuff we're talking about, um, well, no, maybe not most, a lot of the stuff we're talking about can be grown from cuttings um, as well. So, and again, your neighbors are a great source for those. <coughs> Um, and also, when you go to get them for your neighbors, you can see all their little tricks on how they do things. Because that has been the most educational thing for me, is getting into other people's gardens. Every time I go into a garden, I learn something. Some, sometimes it might be what not to do. <laughs> but I learn something, and those lessons are extremely important as well. Uh, let's see. So as we're going out, we're getting taller things, um, right? We don't want to put a coconut tree that's going to get 100 feet tall and 30 foot wide and drop coconuts, you know, 15 feet from a house. It's going to cause problems. And coconut trees, you ever see pictures of coconut trees leaning out over the ocean? You know why they do that? To get the light. So if you plant a coconut tree, like too close to your house, You've got a roof that reflects light. Hmm. It's going to purposefully lean over your roof to get that light. So, so proper spacing. That's all written down there for you. Um, so, so let's say we already have a garden or orchard. How do we make those more productive? Okay. Um, so one of the first things to do, I feel, is to create an inventory. See what you have. Where are we now? Right? What do you have? Do you have, um, have year-round avocados? Um, do you have long season ulu? Do you have enough coconuts? Um, do you have enough bananas? Right? That's the, that's the very core. So if you've got plenty of that stuff, then you're on the right track. If you don't, that's the first place that, that's the first thing I would address, is getting those fruit trees, those very, very key fruit trees, in abundance. Um, Which can you just say what those were again? Um, banana or plantain, yeah. coconut, uh, ulu, avocado. And these are all these are all written down. This is in the top ten list in the, on the list here. Okay. Um, so uh, creating a map is very helpful for this as well if you haven't already. And this doesn't have to be completely spatially accurate. <coughs> what you do need to know is the distance between trees to each other. Okay, so you don't need to like map out the edges of your entire, I mean it's good if you can, but you don't have to. If you know the distances between your certain trees, between your house, you can start to, you can, and you don't have to be like, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if you can at least get in the ballpark, you'll be all right. Um, so creating the map, doing an inventory, seeing the places where we need to fill those gaps, okay? And then going about filling those. And not only in space gaps, but again, we talked about time gaps. So where are places where we can get some other crops in while maybe some of these other crops are maturing? Um, planting mulch crops, using mulch crops. How is that working for your place? You know, are the trees, do you feel like your trees are getting the fertility they need? Are they producing? Um, maybe there's a nutrient deficiency that they need. Um, so these, you can do that from a soil test. You can also just, you know, give them what you think they may need. Like, have you, have you spread uh, lime? You know, when's the last time you spread lime? No, how, how often? How often do people who spreads lime here in some form? And how often do you do it? And how often would you say that you spread it on your place? Or three times a year? Three times a year? Twice a year? Yeah. Twice to three times a year? 
It depends on the size chunk too. Like the fine powdery limes go faster. Something like oyster shell that's chunkier will last longer. Sure. Same so like it depends on the size of it as well. If it's a larger chunk, it's going to last longer, be slower release. Or if it's finer, it'll disintegrate faster. Would you want to do that seasonally, like, like early summer instead of like in the middle of winter? When be, is there a certain time that people like to do that? <coughs> I was yeah, told the best way to line is line about two weeks before you fertilize. It's kind of symbiotic. I've heard something very similar. The liming two weeks before you fertilize <coughs> is good. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the science behind that, but I've heard the similar thing. Doesn't the yellowing of a plant indicate need for lime? Yellowing is generally an indication uh, for nitrogen. So pee on it. So so if so, but if you have if you if you feel like your orchard is neglected, if you haven't spread lime in a couple years, that's probably the first place I would start. And then following two weeks after that with an application of fertilizer or compost. Another method, and I'd like to see if other people follow this. It's supposedly for um, citrus trees that um, coffee grounds are very good. Coffee grounds for citrus trees. Anybody else here that coffee grounds are good for citrus trees? Yeah. I just want to mention that um, a lot of times the you know going by the, the color of the leaf is really hard to tell what the deficiency is or yeah. if you have a disease problem. And there's Scott Nelson at UH Hilo. If you just take a photo of it on your camera and send it in to him, he'll tell you. You know, oh. like we had a boron deficiency and oh. we didn't even have a clue that that. Cool. Worked. So I've been wondering really about that great. at my place, actually. So yeah. she's saying that Scott Nelson at the University of Hilo? He's at Hilo. And you can just Google and look for their roster. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. You can look at the... So Scott Nelson at University of Hilo, you can send him a photograph, and he'll tell you uh, your nutrient deficiency. Hmm. Or disease. Or disease. In existing gardens and orchards. Oh, uh, creating a calendar. Getting some kind of a schedule down so you know when the last time your trees have been given these special things. You know when the next time they're going to get fertilizer is. You know, trees. It's like it's like um, it's kind of like an animal. You know, it's like uh, you have a dog. You feed your dog like every day, right? Well, you have your plants and you don't feed them for you know months or years. You know, what do you expect to happen? I mean, if, 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 if yeah. Uh, when you use the Hawaiian uh, planting um, uh, daily chart, you the Hawaii planting that? charts, yeah. I, I have used that a little bit. And I've also just recently been induced to, um, it's called Stella Natura. And um, this old timer was telling me that the best time uh, to weed whack is um, right after the full moon, a couple days after. And this other old timer was, show, was telling me about the Stella Natura calendar. And it perfectly coincided with a growth spurt towards the full moon. And then right up, so cutting it right after it's had its growth spurt that stunt it back. That's really all I needed to have proof enough you know, that this stuff is, that it works, that the moon, all the planets, you know, these cycles have an influence on plants. Yeah, And so, yeah, I, I, I definitely believe there is, there's some truth to that stuff. I don't necessarily follow it strictly um, throughout the year. You know, coming into the rainy season, you know, is a great time to plant most things. I want to thank everybody for, um, for taking part in the conversations as well and you know, giving your feedback on different things. It's really, you know, working together is how we're all going to make this happen. Um, um, let's see, what is it? Um, the resiliency isn't about, um, it's not so much about diversity. It's about the beneficial interconnections between the parts. Mm. And this mm. goes for plants, and this goes for us as well. Mm. So, 
having things work together, you know, the plants work together, we work together, that's how it all happens. So, wow, we actually got through all that. So into the plants. <laughs> so top 100 food plants. Top 100 food plants. Um, you know, that's kind of a disclaimer, big disclaimer here. <laughs> My top 100 food plants may not be your top 100 food plants, right? We all have different, every site is different. It's like every person is different. So this is going to be adjusted to wherever you are. I'm in Kapoho, and this is... This list is pretty good. Um, if you're above a thousand feet, you're probably not going to be able to grow ulu or coconuts very well. Um, so you're going to need other things to take those gaps. Um, and some of the possibilities are, um, let's see, well you've got the avocado still for oil. That's a good one. Uh, peely nut could be a substitution for oil. Mac nut uh, is another good oil crop. So there's so many different ways to look at these different plants, and it was really hard for me to settle on, on this format with what's the top plant and work down. <clears throat> but I did it because where do we start? If you're just starting or if you want to maximize your, your production, your food production, and the resiliency of that food production, where do you start? And so that's why I settled on this format. Um, but some of the other formats that I considered and I think would really be good things to see is the breaking things down into, well, here's your trees, right? Here's your bushes. Here's your small emergent herbs. Here's your ground covers. These things, but all of that information is listed in the size of the plant. Okay, so just pay attention to that and you'll be able to make your own sub-list inside here. So, if, for example, you have a spot, you know, where something could go, any number of certain things, that size could fit into that spot. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, so, um, and then, um, so we can also break things down into their nutritional content, right? Is it a carbohydrate? Is it a protein? Is it a vitamin and mineral crop? Is it a culinary and medicinal crop? Okay, so I've also added that stuff. Um, and again, there's, we've got six pages here. So it's crammed in, there's abbreviations used, it's all explained. Um, so let's go from the top down. Um, so I ate one of my props, but here's the other one. <laughs> um, so banana, again, as I said before, green bananas is a starch crop, not just the sugary sweet ones. Those are good too, but you know the people who rely on this crop for food worldwide, they eat a lot of them cooked. <clears throat> There's lots of different varieties. Uh, specific cooking varieties that have they have nicer textures. Though I have used uh, apple bananas, um, you know, making uh, green banana fries. Um, you can also just cook bananas whole like this. You can take them whole, peel and all, put them in a pan, put them in a pot with water, some oil, because the oil will keep the because it's latex, it's sticky skin in green banana, right? Put the oil so you don't wreck your pan, and then just boil them right in the skin. And once it's boiled, you can just peel the skin right off, real easily. And then you can use that any way you'd use, you know, a boiled potato. You know, you can you can mash it after that. You can fry it, you can bake it. What type of oil do you recommend? Uh, coconut oil. Coconut oil. Just a tiny They're bit. They're really good in soup too. They're really good in soup as well. At what point would you harvest the green banana? At what point would you harvest the green banana? Great question. Um, usually, usually when the when the leaves, when all the leaves have, have died on on the stalk, it's a good indication that it's getting close. Um, and then sometimes you can tell by, you know, it'll 
the ridges will go away, but some varieties obviously have ridges still. Roughly. Um, let's see. Um, so planting. So planting bananas. <laughs> We use, um, so planting bananas um, we use is by division. Right, so this little baby plant is attached to the mom here. So we want to cut that down, separate this plant out. We're looking for plants like that. That's a sword sucker. This is a water shoot. This is the kinky you want, not this one. Okay, this is going to make a nice strong kinky. This is going to be a really weak, slow growing kinky. This one has a thin stem. It goes straight down. This one has a big fat at the base, real narrow at the top, and then little sword-like leaves. Right? So sword sucker is what it is called. Also, the, the healthy ones, the good ones, are shiny, and the water suckers are real pan. The, the, the stem the on these is, is almost perfectly straight. Not shiny. The stem on these, it's fat. The fatter the base, the better the kicky. Mm -hmm. Tapering out like that. Okay. Um, there are some banana diseases that can be transferred from keiki. So what people often do is they'll sh cut all of the roots off of that base. And people use machetes for this. You can trim all the roots off. And if you see any black spots, um, that can be weevil damage, nematode damage. You want to make sure all of that's removed. If there's too much of it, you can't. You, you shouldn't use the keiki because you're just going to bring that disease into your into your new planting. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else. So cutting the roots will help cut the disease. Yeah, you cut the roots off, and people will even sometimes dip them in a diluted bleach solution. Mm -hmm. You just dip it in for like a couple minutes. I mean, to, to eliminate the roots? To eliminate the roots? No. It doesn't. It'll still root again. It'll still root again, yeah. What rate yeah, it's, I, it felt very extreme the first time I did it. Um, but yeah, you can, I mean, you can cut it down. People do it with machetes. What ratio do you recommend for bleach to water? Oh man, I can't remember. Anybody know the like sterilization bleach ratio? 10%? Yeah. That sounds a little strong. I'm not sure. You can find it online. Um, so, let's see. What else? So, the 9 to 18 months. Um, a lot of this information is written down. Um, you know, it's written down for you, so you're going to have it at home. So, I've got a half an hour, or now probably like 25 minutes, to go over 100 plants with you guys. So, so I'm going to be focusing on the top 25, and I'm going to be focusing on kind of the, the, the tips and tricks that aren't included here. Okay, so I'm not going to go over kind of, uh, you know, spacing, height, even like how long things take to produce. It's all right here for you to take home with you. So I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to go into extra stuff that's not on here. Um, coconut, um, but I will talk about this because you know, we all love these, right? Drink them like this, but this isn't where the nutrition is in a coconut. It's right here. The fat content in a mature coconut. You can hear it shaking, you can hear the water shaking in there. You can use the sprouted ones as well. It changes very different nutritional content from a young coconut to a mature coconut. Very, very different. So when we're talking about coconut, this is what we're talking about, right? Coconut milk, coconut cream. So, and the traditional way is to shave this off, or you can also, we'll take a spike, a metal spike, bang it down, twist it, break the shell off, pull it off. 
see like little old Thai ladies doing this, husking <laughs> coconuts. Um, and then, <laughs> so once this is peeled, take the machete, pop, 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 breaks it right in half perfectly around the side there. And then you have a stool with a grater on it. You sit on the stool and you grate it. <laughs> and once that's grated, you press it um, and you can make coconut cream that way. You can also use a Vitamix. You can also use a champion juicer. Um, you need to chop it into pieces first before you put it in there. <laughs> um, any other ways that people use to make coconut cream or coconut milk? Yeah. Uh, there's a drill attachment from India that's far better than any of those other options. A drill attachment yeah, from India? 20 bucks sent from India and it's amazing. Do you mount it to something? I On my drill. <laughs> it's a drill it bit and it has like. the, the cutter attachment. And okay. again, I was with my champion. I had to replace the blades because it, when it gets really good, it's like rock solid. So that was my best right. that I cool. found. Cool. So, so I don't know if everybody heard that, but there's a drill, apparently a drill attachment you can put on your drill um, to do that. From India, she ordered it? Yeah, I found it on eBay. That, that was the place. Uh, it's called a, uh, a coconut shredder. Coconut uh, shredder. A little bit. I mean, they have machines like that. Yeah. They'll like sit on anything too, but they're probably pretty pricey. You know what? It works almost as good as the machine. Honestly, oh, cool. yeah. They've got does. a hand crank one too. It makes sense. Uh, I use I, it. It seems kind of dangerous to me, but <laughs> maybe to mount it to something somehow. No. Well, you could put it in a vice if you were really afraid. Okay. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Seriously, uh, but if you put it on a hammer drill, it's like two seconds. Like it's it's clear no. in two seconds on a hammer drill. Cool. So, but a regular old battery, you know, lightweight nine okay. point two volt, you'll still get it completely done in a minute. Okay, nice. <laughs> but I do have some questions, though, uh, sure. about the... Okay, so with these more mature coconuts, are you leaving them on the tree till they drop? And yes. Then once they drop, how long do you kind of leave them on the ground? Um, like, do you have a time frame for that? Um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, they'll start... Eventually, they'll start sprouting. You can still use them for oil once they've sprouted. Um, so there's no aging time, kind of like a, the pumpkin. It's like once it just drops from the tree, it's about as good as it's going to get for its fat content. Yeah, unless it's kind of unless it's kind of still green a little bit, I would let it get completely brown like that before I use it. Can they go bad? Um, they can go bad occasionally. And wait, I wanted to add something yeah. too. Yep. I don't know how many people like to make smoothies in the morning, mm -hmm. but a yeah. coconut milk base is the way to go mm -hmm. before you even start. And and uh, uh, the what Wade, Wade's brown coconut there, you know, g getting it open and taking the chunks and breaking them up and putting them in a Vitamix with some water, blending it up and then using one of these guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This yeah, is a paint strainer. strainer bag. Thank you. And you just strain it right through there, and it takes like less than five minutes to make your coconut soup base and you can you can really you can make soup you can make smoothies this is the secret right here yeah. so the paint strainer <laughs> it does but it's just diluted with water yeah, and there, so coconut oil that's kind of a whole nother process of refining that I say you know, use it like it is. Use the coconut, coconut milk. It's, I mean, you know, to go to that other step is a huge process. Yeah. So you're saying the nutrition isn't really in the keikis, even though they're really good for hydration and for electrolyte sure. replacement. Yes. Yeah. The primary nutrition, the oil content. Hmm. But is eating the, the jelly milk. and drinking keikis. That's still good. That's still all good. I'm not saying don't do that. Right. I'm saying the primary nutrition, nutrition is in the mature nuts. And what about the sprouted ones? They have a lot of nutrition too. Yep. Yeah. The, the cotton candy? Um, yeah, and especially that layer inside there, you know, how, how oily, oh, yeah. you know, the, so the meat gets. Eating in that the, meat as well. And that layer gets, yeah. So you've got green coconut. Yeah. And you let them sit for a couple of weeks. They'll tend to go sour. Right. So what's the difference of having green coconut that will turn into oil nuts? Right. Let them ripen on the tree. They'll naturally fall off the tree when they're ready, usually. 
Okay, so if you pick them off the ground, you, then... I mean, sometimes a tree will drop nuts that just aren't aren't ready, right? Okay. And then those, those won't ripen. But normally, if you pick a green coconut off the tree, then it's a green coconut, but if it's fallen, usually it's got to a point where it won't be sound. Is that how it works? Um, usually, yes, ideally. I mean, if it, if it turns brown and it shakes, it's good to go. If it, if it doesn't, if it rot, if it's all funky looking on the end, then you know, it's, it's not good. So, and just a little bit about spacing. The coconut tree gets 30 foot wide. How far does it need to be from the next coconut tree? I like 40 foot spacing on coconuts. For plantations, they say 20 feet you can do. Um, but 40 foot spacing makes it so the fronds are not touching each other. If the fronds are touching, they're banging against each other. It's constantly, slightly injuring the tree. Also, if you have a wide spacing like that, the trees go straight up. If you have trees that are really close together, they lean right out. So if you're going to try to climb those trees with the climber, it makes it extremely difficult or impossible. Um, also, coconut trees, um, create really dappled shade. When they get that tall, if they're just dropping their fruit, you can pick it up to the ground, you don't have to do any work. You just walk up to the tree and pick up fruit off the ground. That's efficiency. Right? Look up. And if the tree is way up there, it's creating very light shade so you can grow a lot of other things around underneath that tree. Okay, so we've got our coconut overstory, and then we've got our understory of ulu, avocado, you know, all these other plants. Yeah. In nature, it seems like coconut trees grow in clumps. They do because they drop their coconuts around them, and then that's what sprouts. Yeah, but I'm sure that they're healthy. Um, they may be, but they may not be easy to climb. And they may create a lot of dense shade in a big clump like that that's not as usable to plant other plants in around. Hmm. How safe is it having your little trees under coconut trees? Um, it's nice to have it. It's nice to have it spaced out far enough. Um, and also around coconut trees, I like to plant some kind of a, a bed around the bases so you're not walking directly under it. Like, you know, like a, an eight foot radius all the way around the bed so you're not constantly, you know, walking right underneath the coconut tree that could drop coconuts on it. <laughs> Things that can take a coconut falling on them. Things I need, sure. Um, all the, there's lots of ground covers here. Um, so we've got. Um, let's see. So we're setting yourself up for being hit on the head if you're climbing and stuff. Um, I don't spend a lot of time. It's not something I spend a lot of time there. I mean, if your bike helmet on the put a bike. Yeah, put a helmet on. There you go. Um, I mean, I spend maybe like you know a minute under the bed in a year. No. Okay. Well, my brother has a 70-foot and he has a shield. Usually you can trash against because you can't walk under the tree without the coconut. And the bed will be long established for the coconuts. Okay, so um, any other <laughs> questions on coconuts? <laughs> yeah. If people don't want to use a spike, I have a access to a coconut husker. It's really easy to do for machete, so it's pretty much not damaging your body. Okay. So it allows people who are not physically able to pack it apart to use the Yeah, he says he's got some kind of a special tool you can wow. talk to him about that. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, Ulu. Right, this is a great carb crop. Okay, lives a long time. Um, they can get really tall. It's good to prune them to keep them harvestable. Okay, that, this goes with pretty much, pretty much all the trees on this list. If you see something that says 50, 60 feet, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to let it get that tall. Okay. Um, there's also a link here to um, a Ulu propagation or breadfruit propagation or <coughs> production guide, I think it's called, um, and it tells you how to prune the trees, how to use the fruit, all that information. So I highly recommend checking it out. It's it's a free download. Um, gives you 
all information on Hulu. But you said not so Hulu for a thousand feet. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry. That link is on your. That link is on your. That link's on here in the back. Okay. Yep. Oh, um, so Hulu, excellent. Um, you can you can use the fruit. You know, cooked as a starch. You can't let it ripen and cook it there. Um, raw, it's a purgative. So don't eat Hulu raw. Unless you uh, want to throw up. Oh, the, the Samoan kind you can eat raw? Yeah, after it gets soft. After it gets really soft. Because I've had friends who were like, oh yeah, you can eat this, and then ate it, and then... So... So it's the Samoan kind only, huh? Oh, yeah, and then it, it, it eats so soft if it's sweet. I eat mine raw all the time. You eat yours raw all the time? Well, if it's soft. I'll eat Lulu Pang. But Lulu Pang, you're cooking it. But but the inside is still raw. No. <laughs> Anyways, let's move on. There's lots of ways to use them. Check out the production guide. It's excellent. I, um, there's just so much information on them. Can you tell us what FS means and PHS? Um, it's, in, it's in the beginning of the thing. It's on the, on the page before. This is name. Okay, God, thank you. Um, so avocado. Um, really great fat crop. Have different seasons. We need different trees for different seasons to get them year round, right? Also, another one you want to prune if you want to be able to harvest the fruit. If you let them drop, you can do that as well, but you got to have some soft ground and you also got to beat pigs to them. You got pigs and rats. Okay, so keeping your trees pruned down, um, you know, 20, 25 feet, so you can still reach them with a picker. Grab. Grafted trees, I rec highly recommend getting grafted trees because you know what season it's going to be, you know the quality of the fruit. Um, you can do seedling trees as well, but they're highly variable. Just because this, you plant the seed from this avocado, there's an excellent avocado, doesn't mean that's what that, what that seed is going to produce. And you've waited five to ten years. And you've waited five to ten years to find out. <laughs> right? So why put all that effort into a tree that, I mean, if you've got, if you've got like a zone five, if you've got a lot of area, throw those pits out. Sure, see what happens. If you have some bad ones, cut them down. But if you've got a limited area or in closer, I highly recommend grafted trees. But also make sure you're covering your bases of getting that year-round production. Question? Yeah. Uh, is there a difference between shiny and matte on the avocado when you're harvesting? I've heard different things about that. Um, I'm not really sure. Anybody else? Anybody when, they, when they get mature, they're supposed to get more matte, and then the stem is supposed to start to turn brown. Yeah. And, and if you if you pick it before that, it, it, oftentimes it won't it won't ripen. Yeah. So the stem turning brown that's the main indicator that I've heard of before. For if the stem is brown, then then it's then you can pick it and it will still ripen up. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's a stem that's still completely green, probably won't. In lower Thank elevations, Kahulu avocados are beyond amazing. Lower elevations, Kahulu, awesome. Fairly short season though, right? It's worth it. It's worth it though. Yeah. Yeah. Super high fat content. There's different fat contents for avocados as well. So this is another uh, reason to get grafted trees because you'll know what you're getting because there's a huge range as far as the fat content in avocados. So when you graft, you can. That's called top working. You can you can cut the top of that tree off and then graft to it. There's a couple different ways people do it. I don't want to get too far into that. Um, but look look it up.